sort of interesting point, anchor points, I think, uh, that the film has that enables viewers to fall into it, you know? Because um, I think if it was all just moments, um, I, I think it would be taken a bit differently. So can we talk a little bit more about each of these? So the the title, so I, I mean, I think it's more than, I mean, they, they do sort of both add a sense of structure, but they are kind of, they're not descriptive so much as give us moments to sort of think and 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 almost kind of challenge us and sort of try to access a kind of different part of our brain. I mean, um, how do we not frame someone? Whose yeah. time is this? What is the orbit of our dreaming? I mean, these are all things that are not like descriptive of action. It's not like a narrative is unfolding, but it challenges us to sort of place these images in a different context from which we're currently experiencing them. And I, I, and I think that it's used like just enough. If it was used an awful lot, it would sort of get in the way. And whenever it comes, it's kind of like a treat that sort of comes up there. And, and I think my favorite one was where he said, Bootsy is having none of the film. Yeah. She'll have, or yeah. she'll have none of it. Yeah. 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 They're, yeah. They're humorous at times too. And, you know, and the film has a lot of humor in it that is, that really deepens the experience. Like when the little boy is with his dad, he just like slaps him on the face, you know? Yeah. There's all these pockets of humor that I think are really incredible. Kristen, talk about long takes. Long takes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I think it's safe to describe his camera as unflinching, you know? It doesn't, um, it, 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 it stays put and it, it, sits inside of a super focused moment. I think when I think of long takes for this film, I think of two sequences, which it's interesting. Maybe you can just call them shots since they're not sequences since one shot. But the first being uh, we're behind uh, Daniel while he's practicing basketball and we are- Oh man. Um, as he's going to drill. Yeah. It's like he's attached to his back. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's so close to him and he's doing this yeah. drill. And you're just with him, with his body, uh, for three minutes or so. And he's making shot after shot after shot. He never misses a basket. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Um, it's really That's incredible. a great shot. And the second being of the child running back and forth from yeah. the living room. Oh, and that's it. that's the other one. Oh my. That was my favorite. That was my oh. favorite. Oh my God! What a shot. But I think that, um, yeah, yeah, and they're both incredible. And, and by the way, again, both by being there and knowing those people and also the basketball shot, having played basketball, he sort of knows where to be and has a kind of sense about that. But I think the other sort of way to think about that, these things is that overall, this film is about time and playing with time. I mean, think about the title of the film this morning, yeah. this evening. I mean, time is sort of essential essence of how we're sort of feeling about this. And, and it's re-examining our notion of what happens in time and how one moment is not the same as another moment and different things appear to take forever and different things just start over in a moment. And I think the, the um, one of the overall structures of the editing is to try to finesse that or, or to deal with that sense of time. And that's why those incredibly long moments, incredibly long shots or incredibly long sequences or like that shot of just going down that street, um, which just sort of go on for a long time. They, in, in another project that would seem off put or wrong, but this, is, is very much in that notion of having us experience what that is and as these characters feel these things. And I think- Do, do you that, remember the shot where they're tracking along a field from, yeah. left, from right to left? And, yeah, it's lo and the sound is the basketball game. And so the, the track's playing completely against the picture and it goes on and on and on and it's magical. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And then there's also, you know, aside from time, there's, there's this whole sort of nature thing. There's, you know, shots of the moon, lots of shots of the moon. And, and speaking of time, you know, how much a time lapse is there? There's an awful lot of like time lapse Definitely. photography. Um, and, and again, trying to question our notion, notion of that. But there are so many shots of, 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 of flies, bugs, you know, things that are out there in nature and, and cyclical things like the circle of life, which is, you know, very much true. And, you know, bursts and how all of those things, you know, kind of um, affect people. Um, I can see in the notes here, Raquel wrote, Jane and Jim are both teachers of film. What do you think about this filmmaker's process? Jane, you want to say anything? Definitely. I connected with this film so strongly because it's just the root of where I'm working from. And, and having that background in photography, and I think it was definitely to his advantage. It, it, it allowed him to see differently and he came and he arrived at a place what I think is so exciting for documentary photography. I have not seen anything like this before in documentary photography. And I became very enthusiastic about his work and his approach. And I think it's fresh and it's new and it's very exciting. And I love to see that kind of um, connection uh, that it's not divorced from photography, from still photography but it's meshed with it and how exciting that is. And he came uh, out of RISD. Did he really? Yeah. Uh, do you know he, who he might have studied with? No, but he was a, it, it was, he was a still photographer to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. It's very apparent. You know, his vision is just so beautiful and poetic as you described Bart. You know, it's just, he knows what he wants to see and his vision it allows him the space to, to make those discoveries. So um, he's out there to make those discoveries. And well, I just think it was beautiful uh, and so moving and so effective in, in his message. You know, it was so authentic. Uh, it was heartbreaking. Yes. It was, uh, meanwhile, back at the story, it was heartbreaking. It was, it was, it took us, took me to like any great documentary to a place I couldn't even imagine. And <clears throat> Well, he just really it, allowed us to see in a different way as an audience, you know, yeah. an experience in a different way. Um, and I think it really all comes back to his vision. Um, Did you struggle at all with understanding uh, no, <laughs> actually, I, I, I followed it very easily. You know, I just, I, it was just very fluid to me. And, uh, and I think part of that is his approach again. Um, and the editing was just seamless and absolutely amazing. So, uh, and, and the story behind that is incredible how, how he w was able to work through all of those um, recordings. Yeah, something I've heard him say in interviews, which I think speaks to both the, the points being made here, is in photography, it, the, you know, the ideal photographic image, the still photographic image, everything is there at once, you know, and it's, it's all there facing you, and it has this relationship inside of one frame, which I think he, he, he is doing with so many of these moving images, where they're relatively static, but you have all of these elements that are operating on so many levels and when you have a film that has image after image of any infinite number of levels you know it creates this this emotional feeling and i think yes it is so heartbreaking to consider the the death of the child in the film and i think a uh, image that ties these points together is when uh they're in the drive through towards the end of the film and the mother holds up her phone that has a photograph of the baby who died while the baby who lived is in her lap you know so in this one image you're seeing you're seeing her way of connecting with her dead child the child that is still living and you're seeing her experience her grief you know uh and it's just so yeah it really yeah it really brought me to down you know in a really serious way and 
I think it was, um, I agree that it was uh, sad that yes, there were sad uh, stories, but it was so raw. It's like when we watch movies, they take stuff out so that we can handle it, so that we can consume it. This was so raw and the entire thing was life on earth. It was, it, you know, it, the bees, the stars, the sound of the wind, all of those things that connected the little nuances between the humans. It was life and death, resurrection, uh, this morning, this afternoon. It's all one thing. So it was not as sad to me as it was acceptance of this is, this is where we live. This is how we are. This is who we are. This is it. Nothing is predicted. Uh, you can practice. You can do your best. But you know what? At the end of the day, something can happen and completely throw off your world. Um, you know, just the surrender to our physical condition where we live on this planet with gravity and all of the laws that we cannot control. You know? <sighs> yeah. You know, Neela, was you were saying that, I was thinking that, um, you know, actors, when they're going to acting school, are trying to find a way to make moments real. You know, like, how do you take something and have that external sense of what is real. Every frame in this is incredibly real and honest in a way that a lot of documentaries aren't because a sit down interview is a sort of controlled thing. That This is like a full length, like every, totally real. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, the shooting harkens back to the direct cinema Art, you know the the um, uh, the Maisels and all of that in terms of being at that moment, yet from a more poetic perspective. The editing, instead of just simply telling a story, it really comes from a fine arts perspective about time, and more of almost a video art perspective about how to manipulate time, but using those cinema verite direct cinema approaches all within the same thing and i think that's one of the it's very rare that a piece of media can do that really well yeah and i think another of course an obvious layer to this film is the way it, it presents blackness you know like it's presenting a concept of blackness that i would say hardly exists in mainstream american cinema you know the it is so it, it is very narrow, I would say, American cinema's idea of blackness if we are looking at the cinema, you know? And I think this film is genius because it's about these individuals as human beings in life in an ex deeply existential way. And it can totally like not even participate in, in that conversation, you know? And, and something I heard Romel Ross say it via YouTube, which was really great, was, I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he's saying, you know, racism is an idea with very material consequences and, and yeah, consequences for people. But it's an idea that is enforced by media, you know, by film, by imagery. And that is just something I think that this film totally subverts in its own way that's really brilliant. Um, it chooses to not participate in enforcing these you know, tropey ideas. And, I, and it's, it's totally self-aware in what it's doing. And I, I would point to the archival footage uh, at the plantation house. Two shots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and, it's just like they, they, I mean, that's one of those things that in the moment it takes you out of the film because it's like so different than the language of everything else. And then it's so shocking. It's like, but then it, it what it does is exactly what you were talking about, that it references how people have been presented in films from a historical perspective. So immediately it makes you conjure up the, the, the argument you just made. And without having to say anything, it's just a cut that sort of gives you that as a sort of idea. So Mark, yeah. uh, 
So we're, we're watching this film in this moment. Yeah. Uh, through the filter of the virus, through the filter of Black Lives Matter. And uh, so it resonates in a way that it might not have just a year ago or a few months ago. Um, you want to talk about that? Well, I mean, it's sort of, in one sense, sort of intuitively obvious that the idea of just exactly what Christian was saying, you know, that how a lot of things that people are talking about, what statues are and what they say about us, also is how films and how do they, how does, how do films support many people as culture. And I think by redefining who people are and who gets to control that image, it's really, um, you know, kind of important. I don't know per se that COVID that has an influence on how we respond to this, except that we're at home more so we can see more things on. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. It has, a, it has an effect on how we respond to everything these yeah. days. You can't ignore it. I, I, I guess so. But to me, the, 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 um, the protest and, and or I should say the, the awareness. Yeah. The one time in the history yeah. of the country's awareness of race in a really profound way and not it's just different. a small thing and making a small steps. I, I, as long as I've been alive, I can't. And self-evaluation, self-evaluate. There's, it's given time to a lot of people that maybe would have not normally sit and think for a minute about themselves and where they stand and who they are. So I think the time, yeah, COVID has affected us because it's made us stay home and just shut up for a minute, you know, and, and go inside. So, um, Kristen, do you want to talk a little bit about what you've seen in the protests? Because you've been there a lot. And, you know, what, what are you seeing and how is this affecting you? Sure. I'd like to make one point again uh, on that other previous point of another interesting thing in the film that it doesn't do, which is linking to that early title card of how do we not frame someone, you know, mm. uh, which is an impossible, you know, idea. You're constantly framing people, you know, min, you know in all kinds of ways. But the moment that sticks out to me and Hale County is he's in, I guess he's in a GED class or something. And an older man is like, is on a soliloquy about how he enjoys being rural and how he, he doesn't like, he detests this idea of people labeling rural folk as, as Lester or something. And so he's going on this rant about, you know, I enjoy picking pecans, you know, I enjoy running out in the field. I enjoy, you know, dove hunting. Or he's just listing off these things that he enjoys that get used as a way to enforce the idea of, of being rural as, as lesser, you know? And I thought that was a really interesting, uh, revealing moment, I think, um, from the position of Ramel Ross. Of, of he's, not, he's not trying to show us people who are poor or rural or black or whatever. He's just that he's there, you know? And I really, really appreciate that approach. Just to state the, the obvious, this, this does what great documentaries do. It, it, it lets us really know what people's lives are and spend time with them and get beyond our perceptions of what we think people might be or things we've seen in other films. And, and these kind of films, which stay on somebody long enough to really get us a real sense of honesty, aside from having an authentic experience, it changes our perception. And, and when we think about what the power that cinema does, it's films like this that are extremely powerful in, in, in altering whatever misconceptions we have. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris, uh, tell us what you've been seeing. I'm, I'm, I've been very curious. I, unless, does anybody have any questions about this film? Particularly? Yeah, guess address? what? I still have a couple. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Uh, Kristen, I wanted, we, we were talking about framing, but this guy's framing is immaculate. And what I'd say, maybe guessing three quarters of the film is handheld. 
quarter of it may be on sticks. So his framing is mostly handheld where he finds this moment that's going to happen and somehow he's in the right place to get that baby running back and forth and back and forth and back and forth through the through the room or um i, I just made some of these shots were uh worth writing down um well the snowy field um yeah the, the, just... there was a shot at the very beginning of just somebody holding a little goldfish in a bowl the guys yeah. the guy's precision at, at finding something in a scene that can then be framed up and held it's just um it was one of the most extraordinary things about the film for me um i really agree the, and the locker it's... room you remember the locker room he's just in one corner of the locker room yeah. before the game and yeah. this entire tableau unfolds right. about one guy pushing another one around and, and all the energy. That's another thing. This film has so much pent up energy in, in its characters. People are running all the time and, and uh, Dunking. <laughs> yeah, and there's so much sport and pushing each other around and, and guys showing off for the camera, you know, a lot of that, but, the energy is kind of is kind of relentless too. The baby bathing, all by herself with her soapy hands. Remember that shot? It's she just water down her body. Did that? That was another one. That was the baby yeah. breathing, just Not breathing yet. with a drool on her chest or his chest. Man, the baby, the baby that was soaping himself or herself. Yes, I thought uh, yeah. was one of the most important scenes in terms of capturing something, that baby was looking at the white soap and the designs wow. it was making covering its skin. And I was very moved by that. That was a single shot, close up, not moving except for the baby's hands with the soap. Yeah. Compared to some of his more surreal shots, like the blurry lights in right. the the sky that were just by themselves for the beauty of the light. And it, the contrast between those two, I thought was startling. And, and literally the deer in the headlights. <laughs> yeah. Goat. Oh, God, that deer just, that poor deer just standing out there on the road. Yeah. Yeah, well, things were going on, completely un unaware. And, and then there's color. There's, there's you know, the, these colored shots from time to time and the color of the, the, the sun and the, I mean, the color plays a role as well. Yeah, the smoke oh, from oh, the yeah. burning tire coming up through the tree. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, that, and against that image, you hear the audio of- He's ripping with some guy in the background. Yeah. yeah, an older man is coming up to him saying, what are you doing, you know? What the hell what are you doing, doing here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's so amazing. It's like this intergenerational discussion. You know, they're so far apart from each other coming together. Okay. You know? Chris, so Christian and I have both been watching uh, Ray Mel on uh, other stuff. So I got to read one thing to you that he said uh, uh, yesterday. It was yesterday in a Q&A. Somebody asked him about showing it to the community. Had he shown the film to the community? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, well, he, he showed it to Danielle and Quin Daniel and Quincy. Mm -hmm. um, and because he knew that it was going to, it was going to be something that they couldn't possibly even imagine happening to them. And this is what he, he said, this is how he described it. It was a diary of mo to, da to, to Daniel and Quincy, a diary of moments that you don't remember from a perspective you've never seen in a beauty that's unfamiliar, elevated to the same space that you watch Black Panther. I love that. That's really great. That's uh, beautifully stated. Yeah. yeah. And he did, show it, he did show it to the community. And, and what they said was, that's us. We never thought anyone would, you know, oh my God, that's, that's us unadorned, not fucked up like we thought it would be by somebody. 
It's just us. Yeah. It's, it's how the world is framed and how you see it that sets that. Thank you for bringing that, this film to me, man. You're welcome. I, it's, a, it's a near perfect documentary. Um, well, it, it was poetically shot and poetically edited. And, um, you know, that it's just a confluence of a lot of things coming together at a time, which documentaries often, often are. Jim, did you have anything you wanted to say about this? Oh, you're muted, Jim. You have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I, I've been like watching festival films and stuff uh, the past couple of years, and it seems like there are a lot of documentaries, kind of hybrid documentary and experimental films. Uh, they're, they're mixed together. And I thought that's what this was, but it was really really distinctive like people who would walk out of experimental films i think would watch this because it builds so much emotion and uh, like lyricism is so intense like the scene of course that you just mentioned with burning the tires and um the editing is so unusual but it the editing isn't boring yet it doesn't try to build a narrative i kept wondering how he would end it and it, I thought it would just stand out a little poetic moment that the character story wouldn't come to a narrative arc or anything. And that's what happened. I think it ended when the one man was playing basketball. He was yeah. exhausted. Yeah. And you tend to think in constructing a documentary to have a narrative arc, you know, it's act one, act two, and act three. And this is really kind of tries to come up with a, a unique language in a different way. The end is the hardest part to find. Well, sometimes, sometimes you're shooting something and you say, that's the end. And sometimes that actually happens. <laughs> sometimes you, you stop what you thought it was going to be. <laughs> so, uh, Christian, what, uh, tell me about, you know, what it's like to be on the ground and what are you seeing and what are you feeling as you're shooting? Sure. Uh, it's a lot, you know, it's a lot. I think I would say I've, I've been sh shooting protests since 2014, 2015, pretty regularly. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel pretty connected with the activist community here. And like everyone, you know, I, I really haven't seen what's happening in front of me before. I see an enormous increase in people participating in the protest, you know? Of course, cause we, you know, today's probably, I think today's like 20, day 25 or 26 in Dallas of daily actions and marches and stuff like that. So just a lot more people, which is fascinating and especially fascinating coming off of uh, the deep quarantine, you know, where downtown was just barren and now downtown is just full of people marching. Uh, I'm seeing coalitions being built between activist groups to stay on message and to focus the energy. Uh, that, is, that is very inspiring to me to see. Um, clarifying demands, clarifying the path towards achieving these demands um you know i i'm there filming and i'm just you know, it's just me and the camera and i'm just roaming around filming all night all day or whatever and just so many incredible moments like i one the one that comes to mind right now is i, uh, I guess this was a week ago a couple weeks ago uh i was shooting we were at city hall and this woman was giving a speech on a megaphone to a crowd and a woman in the audience interrupted her and I think I shared this clip, I'm not sure. This woman in the audience interrupted the woman speaking and very nervously and in tears came to the megaphone and announced to the crowd that like that her friend's cousin was just killed by Garland police that day at the pro while we were all protesting. And so inside this moment, this woman takes the microphone and announces the death of this guy by the police. And then the rest of the evening becomes, you know, dedicated in a way to this guy as we start chanting his name, you know. So there's just an there's just an incredible amount of anger and grief and and activation from people who I think have not participated before. 
which is just really interesting. I find. What are you doing with the footage? You know, I'm not. I'm not sure yet. That's like the big. That's the big thing for me. I don't. I. My intention is to create a series of short films. Um, where those films are held, you know, where they're hosted, I don't know. Right now, I'm on the verge of just releasing them by myself. Um, but I hope next week I will have it, the first short released. I've got a. I've got it in a rough state right now. Um, but I want to release a series of short films about different subjects around what's happening. Um, for example, you know, the first one is about how we have all become onlookers to this movement, whether we want to or not. You know, we're kind of forced in this position of looking at what is happening. Uh, there's a conversation to be had around the Confederate monuments. So I've been shooting interviews around the taking down of the Confederate monument by the Convention Center. There's a conversation to be had about what are the actual demands from protesters, you know, in, in a clear written word sense, in a non-abstracted sense, what can be done in Dallas and what are the obstacles uh, facing us, you know. Uh, so that's, that's my intention, but I'm not sure how it's going to pan out yet. So, Christian, how, how has your filming of these evolved since the days when you were shooting at the at the thing with the pool was that how many years ago was that yeah that was 2015 yeah, yeah. 2015. So you, right you've been doing this for a while and in the beginning you're just you're sort of there and how have you as a filmmaker sort of responded to that and as you've been growing as a filmmaker changed the way you view these your shooting yeah that's a great question i think i'm really trying to just put as much, in, in, at least to record as long as there is a beginning, middle, and end to what's happening, you know? Like that puts me in a much better position in the editing room when, and in the moment when I'm paying, I'm not just paying attention to a fragment of what's happening, I'm trying to follow a thread to the end, you know? And mm -hmm. So I don't have a problem recording for 20 minutes at a time, you know? Uh, Right, and so I think like move over here, move over here. It's like there's a moment, like like, like be there in that moment. Let let that, that sort of stay. Do you do you ask people to talk to you? I've interviewed a couple people, but not 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 so much. I don't know if these are interview based pieces. They might be. Um, they might be. What I'm interested in is how the discourse plays itself out in public spaces. That's what intrigues me how people command themselves and will themselves to talk in front of crowds of folks while they're feeling anger and nervousness and all these things, you know, how city council members sponsor marches and ride in trucks <laughs> instead of actually marching and give their speeches in the back of a truck that make these bold promises, you know, uh, but their votes say something else, you know, I'm, I'm interested in that kind of discourse. Uh, and, but, yeah, I'm not, you know, I, I think I definitely will interview people in a, in a kind of way. For example, with the Confederate Monument, I'll, I'm planning to make one short. I was there last week and I interviewed a son of the Confederacy. And I talked to him for like 40 minutes. And so I interviewed him and then I interviewed a lifelong activist who's been for taking the monuments down. So there is some, so those are interview based. Um, but yeah. I imagine that in itself, that those two characters together would be quite amazing. They, they look somewhat similar. They're both kind of aging with, you know, beards and kind of gray hair, but come from completely different ways of looking at the world in, in the same like city. Um, yeah. and, and it really kind of, we are in the sense of duality and this is a really good, you know, projection um, of this, um, which I think is, really kind of interesting and, and fascinating. Um, and so anyway, I, I'm very much looking forward to this. I think that um, we are in this incredibly important moment and um, there are a lot of people shooting a little bit of stuff and there are a lot of people with uh, like phones shooting things, but a, a sort of just thinking to what we were looking at and a, a sort of purposeful way of portraying these images are going to be very powerful as we think about like 
what happens in an election in November. And then 10 years from now, when we look back in terms of what was this moment, we'll be able to capture it in a completely different way than what the news or people on cell phones are putting together and it has incredible value. So thank you for, for doing it. Um, does anybody have any other comments or questions? Yeah, Kristen, keep your head down, man. Yeah, and uh, keep wearing your mask. <laughs> I, I I'm happy to say I tested negative yesterday. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy. Very happy. I think in, to to end the point about measuring the temperature of the protest, I feel it dwindling. Like I feel the fizzle happening, and I feel the ramping up of COVID right now. You know, in our area, and I I'm curious. I am curious about what July Fourth will be like, and I'm curious if there will actually be a uh, fizzle out or if something else will happen to reignite, you know, the passion from people. Uh, well, but it's, it's such a dilemma inside this pandemic, like just negotiating, am I going to participate or am I going to be you know, responsible? And, uh, what are the, um, the leaders talking about in terms of keeping the momentum going, where they think it's going for say July 4th or, are they worried about COVID or how they're, I'm sure they are, but how they're sort of thinking about this moment where we've been going on for a long time? Yeah, I would say the, I would say the focus point is September when the city of Dallas has to pass its budget for the next year. And so all the initiatives are pointing towards participating in that dialogue with the city council um, and that is like the milestone that I feel I can point to, you know, in a concrete way. But to, to what end? I think probably changing the funding of the police. The police. Oh, what, what aim? Yes, the, yeah, the, the general idea is you're diverting resources to DPD, from DPD into community resources like uh, affordable housing, homelessness services, rehab services, uh, you know, Mental health. creating trauma responders who aren't police who respond to situations, um, putting money towards different, different places that create safety rather than just the, the, the police. So that's the aim. So a success would be seeing any kind of meaningful uh, uh, divertment of funds from DPD into other idea, other areas where that creates safety in communities. So uh, to that end, are they working on proposals and, you know, working with city council, trying to, you know, do those kinds of, I mean, of course there's, there's a different kind of activism of putting on protest and actually trying to get legislation passed. Budget there's programs. Right. Certainly. And to that point, that's what's curious about this moment. You know, people have been doing this work against police brutality forever, you know. And an example I'll point you to is there's an organization called Mothers Against Police Brutality. Yeah. And last year they were invited, uh, which I work pretty closely with on, on videos and stuff. But last year they were invited by Clay Jenkins and I can't even remember the other city officials, but they were invited to participate in this conversation with uh, council members and Clay Jenkins, and they drafted a 10 point proposal that's available on their website, Mothers Against Police Brutality. Um, and so there are concrete uh, proposals, you know, that have been drafted by people. And what is happening now is you're having all these city council members, you know, verbally acknowledge the pain and and all these kinds of things, but it, I feel like things are really going to ramp up in the discourse when it comes to August and September when these conversations about the budget, which is a reflection of a city's, you know, morals, right. uh, when that conversation really starts to happen. So there are people on this side of the activist sphere who are working, you know. And are you following that, you know, sort of following those efforts? Yeah, yeah, I am. Like I said, I, I, I'm pretty close with that organization. And uh, I'll, I, that's part of the short, the idea with these short films is to chronicle right. different arenas um, that are happening right now. So if I may say, um, 
I hope that everyone here that considers themselves the older generation, I know that there's a lot of people here that are about Christian's age as well. We can be involved. We do not have to be in the streets. We do not have to put ourselves in, uh, you know, in touch with COVID. There are organizations that you can associate yourself with. And when they ask you to reach out and send out emails or text, we need you. We need each other uh, to do that. Find the organizations that you want to support. Um, and you can go to uh, my site or Christian site. And there's other people here um, where there is a list of organizations that you can, you can see who, who speaks to you and donate to them uh, because there's a lot of um, good nonprofits that are trying to do work with very little money. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so um, with that, it is 8.30 and I try to keep this to no more than an, an hour. Um, Kristen, thank you so much. Thank you, Kristen. Um, thank, thank you for uh, pushing us to do this sooner than later and to just uh, hang out with you and talk is always a pleasure. Um, Next week, um, so next week we're going to do The Five Bloods, which is on Netflix. How many people have seen that? Okay, so we're going to have uh, Kevin, uh, what's Kevin's last name? One of the screenwriters of that, um, who's going to be our guest host. He also directed, I don't know if you had a chance to see it when we showed it, uh, CSA, Confederate States of America which we showed back in the 90s. Kevin Wilmot, thank you, Raquel. Uh, and uh, which is, I, if you haven't seen this film, it is somewhere available. It's, it imagines, it, it's, it's, it's a kind of a parody of uh, like the Civil War kind of movie, um, but um, it imagines a world where the Confederacy won. And so that's why it's Confederate States of America. And, it's really funny and then really sad because some of the things are actually true in a case where the Confederacy lost. And it's actually kind of amazing to revisit that. But Kevin um, will be joining us uh, next week. So you'll be able to really get a sense of how that film got shaped. So that'll be same bad time, same bad channel. What's the name of the movie for next week? Uh, the Five Bloods. It's it's on Netflix. It's Spike Lee's film about um, Vietnam veterans who go back to Vietnam to um, to get the uh, the Five Bloods. Did I say that wrong? Yes. Yeah. Five Bloods. Where they go back to uh, uh, to both claim some gold that they found when they were there and to get the remains of their um, of their spiritual leader and their, their commander. Um, and um, it's, it's a really well-made film, a fascinating film. But to hear from the writer of that film, co-writer of the film, will be, I think, really extraordinary. So right. it just happened to work out. So guys, um, thank you. Kristen, thank you so, so much. Um, and uh, keep, keep, keep being there and keep taking tests to make sure you're still OK. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Um, guys, thank you all. Have a great, great week. Be safe. Be safe. There's some good movies to watch. Um, check our newsletter. We'll tell you what to see. And um, working on some cool stuff for the fall. So it's all good. Thank you guys so much. And I, I really appreciate you coming out. It means a lot. Thank you, Bart. Basis. Thank you. I appreciate you doing this. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Christian. Oh.